cloudy, looks like rain. But nothing ever falls on California's plane. Skies look gummy, look crummy, look fake. I can't escape the dull heartache, knowing that my weather's been taken from me. Asking myself, how can it be? Good morning, everyone. This is Kate Magdalena Willens, broadcasting on American Freedom Radio from Northern California. And I am just delighted this morning to welcome Scott Stevens to the show. You know, we um, we are in a position as people learning about the sky to operate more on the level of hearsay, of rumor, of belief. And I know that there are many people in this movement that feel divided on some important issues. And there tends to be mudslinging across the aisle because we believe one thing and the other party believes another. Well, we have the opportunity today to dispel uh, some of those ideas that we may have and actually to get some knowledge from someone that knows far more than, than I know and probably you know as well. And that would be Scott Stevens. And Scott Stevens is a meteorologist who thinks outside the box in some extraordinary ways that really border on the spiritual. So, Scott, I'd really like to welcome you to the show. I'm, I'm honored to be, uh, to be your guest on this side. <laughs> well, thank you. We are so, so honored to have you. And that's really the way I'd like to frame the show. It's moving out of belief and into knowledge, yeah. at least the knowledge that we can garner. Um, I've, I've been looking at your website. Scott's website is... Uh, weatherwars.info. And I have to say, I've only become acquainted with it very recently. I wish I had known about it before. So Scott, um, I just, I wanted to start the show with, with just an imagination that Scott has written in this wonderful website, which I, I highly, you know, hope that all of you will, will go and look at after this show. And he writes, um, think of it like this, our skies, that is, and the aerosols that are going through them. A white crayon being drawn atop a chessboard when the individual blocks that comprise the playing board are capable of moving in four dimensions. These thick contrails laced with aluminum oxide and barium salts are there to reveal the movements of the game of chess played out in the skies above us. So, there we have a poet in a meteorologist. Scott, I just wanted to say I've got at least 10 different topics that I'd like to, you know, give you. And then you can choose where you want to start. And let me just go through those topics just really briefly. Um, can you give us, and you know, you can think about these. And then, you know, after I list them all, please begin where you like. Um, scale, scalar energy, if you can unpack what is scalar. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. um, what are the goals of this program? Okay. Uh, what's happening to the oceans? Mm -hmm. um, how much of the global warming, of the warming that's going on around us, if in fact we can assess that it's there, how much is natural? How much is deliberate? And um, I think, I think, I mean, I have other questions, but I realize that even in bringing those, we have more than we can possibly speak about today. So, <laughs> so true. why don't we? Why don't we start? You know, in, unless you have a particular preference. With, um, I guess even before we get to all of those questions, I would like to know, and I think our, our listeners would like to know your story a bit about how you, as a weatherman, as a meteorologist, you know, in your little box <laughs> that they tried to put you in, how you then began to awaken and see the vistas outside the box and then step outside them, leave your, your position, where you went from there, et cetera. Just a little encapsulation of your story would, would be great. Well, I, weather began interesting me when, well, let's just go back. I was 12 years old, so mm -hmm. 19, 1978, mm -hmm. and I'm looking through the Boy Scout Merit Badge book, the requirements to complete <laughs> the badge, because my goal was my Eagle Scout Award. 
And that, okay. was, that, was, that, was, that was the end goal. And so I'm looking through this book of projects, these book oh. of badges, and I came across weather. I wow. read, the, read the requirements of what I needed to do, the time frame that would, it would take to finish those. I'm like, I can do this. Oh, wow. I like it. I've always liked numbers, numbers and, and, and math and those kind of things that I, had always fascinated me. So I knew I'd end up building a weather station, keeping a weather log, watching the local weatherman, charting his forecast against um, what really happened, and, and begin to kind of do my own forecast. Mm-hmm. And at that point in time, you know, my bedtime was 9.30, like, uh, <laughs> 9.30. The late news was at 10 o'clock. So I also had an alternative motive, and that was to stay up a little later. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> so I hey, got you know, Scott, I just got to just interrupt for one second to say, uh-huh. you guys, can't you all see Scott in his little Eagle Scout uniform? That must have been so cute. Okay, back to your story. Yeah, I was so <laughs> dorky then. <laughs> but um, so that was... I started that in July, July of 78. I did that. I did that merit badge. And, and we, we all know now in psychology, it takes about 21 days of doing something regularly to form a habit. Wow. A pattern in your behavior. Mm, mm. So by the end of that 30 days, I had a pattern formed. A new behavior was instituted in, in, my, in my daily life. And that was this voracious appetite of a young scientist who who had been building model airplanes since the time he was seven years old Mm -hmm. and looking at the sky and fascinated by stars and weather and Mm -hmm. airplanes. You know, Mm -hmm. that was all set in my my future. Mm -hmm. And so I got the merit badge. Eventually that February, before I was 13, had my Eagle, Eagle Scout Award. But actually even, I got to rewind a little bit. One of those things you had to do for the Eagle Scout Award was a community service project. Mm -hmm. And with this newfound love of weather, and I kind of internally adopted this new weatherman that had come to eastern Idaho by the name of Ken Torrey. He'd come from a big market, Cincinnati. He was a New Yorker by by, by birth. Mm -hmm. So he's found his way all the way out west to to begin to raise his young family. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought, well, I could be one of his weather watchers. I could, you know, have, I could call in every day and right. you know, share my high, low and precipitation and observations, you know, from, from my little town. And so I approached him with that. And he, he said, no, Scott, I've got 36 towns and it's enough for right now. But would you like to come in, and bring your dad and tour the station, tour the new station? And my hand went up. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah. So we, we, we scheduled the time and, and my dad and my little my younger brother and I went in and, and, and toured the place and I was fascinated. Fascinated. And at, at the end he said, Here here's my number, here's here's the what here's the phone number to the weather office. If something unusual happens out there, give me a call. Wow. Let me know. Mm-hmm. So I think two, two and a half months later it was it was the middle of April in eastern Idaho and it was just And what wait, what year are we in? Um, this would have been uh, February '79. Okay. Feb of '79, and so I, I call in and say, "Hey, Ken, you know we got up to 76 degrees today and 37 to, in, in the morning." And he said, "That's kind of funny because I just had somebody drop off my list who can't do it any longer. So how would you like to be the weather watcher for your town?" I'm like, "Sure thing, I'll be <laughs> here every day." And so I, Ken and I just developed this relationship. Mm-hmm. And we, we talked every day for, for three years and just, just, you know, I had a mentor. I had a mentor. And you don't realize how important those are. Mm-hmm. And that's something that's, that's, I won't say wholly lacking, but to a significant degree, the, these kids are growing up in schools without a mentor in what will eventually be their chosen career. Mm-hmm. And it was really important to me. So I get towards my senior year of school and I, I, you know, worked the farm. I had moved pipe. You know, harvested potatoes. Uh, you know, done all those things you do in, in farm country when you're when you're growing up with a, a poor school teacher dad. And wait, what's what state were you born in and raised in? Idaho. Idaho. Okay. Idaho. Yeah, I have moved a little bit, um, Utah, New Mexico, primarily, but back to Idaho after an experience in Gallup, New Mexico. My parents are like, ah, we're out of here, mm-hmm. and so they retreated north. Mm-hmm. But anyway, um, there was an opening at the station. Uh, for a production assistant, essentially somebody to um, be an errand boy and run studio camera during the newscast. Mm-hmm. And um, Ken's like, you know, Scott, is this something you'd be interested in? I'm like, yeah, 
how am I going to get to, you know, I live 50 miles away, so how was I going to manage that distance? Mm -hmm. So I talked to mom and dad, and they said, well, follow through. Follow through, see what happens. I ended up getting the job and then moving out of home and then in with in with Ken and his, his family. He cleared out one of the girls' bedroom, and, and I had I had a back bedroom. And so I, you know, I, it's so amazing, Scott. I mean, just, just to say, you know, I really see the arc of life destiny here. I mean, you know, that you knew at such a young age what you wanted to do and that it was as if you were following, you know, you were just kind of following what was ahead of you, you know, that it was all there for you. Amazing. And, and, and it is that way for each and every one of us. If we can get out of our own convoluted and fear way of thinking, all of these life paths are laid out, and it's just owning it, just owning it. And 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 that's something else that I dealt with at the very end of my of my TV career was you know I just had to do this. So I ended up working at the TV station and, and fell in love with it. Um, you know, minimum wage is three thirty five an hour, and that's all I got. That's all wow. I got. Good thing you were living at Ken's house, right? Oh my God! Yeah, goodness. But you know, I ended up editing tape, you know, doing scripts, and then being in the weather office and the phone calls, you know, dealing with with the audience, uh, with the viewers, um, the deadline based uh, mentality that that is news, and then the personalities that are there, and then of course there's always management, and advertising, you know, departments you've got to watch out for, and then the creative, the you know, promotional side, and you know, it, it was just a really good place for me to be. So I chose to go to the University of Kansas um, and, and left uh, left KIFI was the name of the, uh, of the station and went to KU uh, primarily because they were not terribly math heavy and, and meteorology was still in the, in the geology department rather than the physics department. Mm-hmm. I, I loved maps and, and the geology of it and weather is, is so uh, weather is largely determined by geography. And where you are on the planet, the terrain, and those kind of things, rather than say the physics and thermodynamics, as I as I as I would later learn. And so my first uh, first semester freshman there, there was a forecast contest. I'm like, yeah, sign me up. I want to see how good I am. Wow. Uh, at the end of end of that, that freshman year, I was second place nationally, wow. and, and and scored very highly even amongst the juniors and seniors. So I realized Ken taught me what I needed to know to to go out in the world. Wow. And so uh, by the end of my sophomore year, I had auditioned for um, Sunflower Cable TV News, which was a, a local local news production in, in Lawrence, Kansas, um, but then applied for uh, an ABC morning uh, meteorologist or weatherman job in Topeka. Didn't get it. Didn't get it. He, he hired three other people. But four months later, he, the news director, Bob Totten, called back and said, Scott, I've got an <laughs> opening, and I'd like you to you, you, you to practice. Come over here for a week and let's just practice. Let's see what happens with you. Mm-hmm. And Bob was important for me because he said, for every criticism I give you, I've got to build you up five, six, seven, eight times. That's mm-hmm. just how you grow. So he is through, you know, reinforcing and, and encouraging rather than, you know, the cutting down and, and you know, tearing something something down before you can build it back up. So that was just kind of a good, a good mentality for me to, to flourish under. Hey, you know what, can we, can we just stop there a second and highlight that point? Mm-hmm. Because, um, you know, if you could just speak it again in your own words, what you just said, I think we need to hear it again because, you know, we are so self-critical and we, we criticize each other and we wonder, you know, why our lives are kind of static. Mm-hmm. And it's this mentorship you're talking about where someone is really uh, supporting us. And even if it's us just supporting ourselves in positive thought, how important that is in moving forward. Well, if, if somebody degrades you, knowingly or unknowingly, conscious or unconsciously, that's something that you mull over in your own internal subjective dialogue. When right. You, talk, you know, you're talking about yourself. Mm-hmm. And those jabs, those sharp encounters we have with other people mm-hmm. are always in there kind of grinding away and cutting at us. And they, okay. they can fester. Mm-hmm. And, and so it, it's far easier to guide someone with kindness mm-hmm. than it is the other way, with the other polarity. Mm-hmm. And and I, you, you, you and I had multiple news directors over the years, and some you just like, oh, how am I going to survive this? How am I going to bloody survive this? Mm-hmm. You mean because they were critical, or they were over managing, or or, and, and or what? Not and not even with you, but to see how they interact with other people, uh, mm-hmm. and so then you try to keep your distance from them. Mm-hmm. 
you, you're like, Oof, I don't want any encounters with this person. So I'll just, I'll just mm-hmm. keep my nose clean. I'll stay silent, and you just stay out of you stay out of that game. Mm-hmm. And so it's you know it's just personal dynamics. It's politics, newsroom politics. Mm-hmm. And so uh, yeah, it's better to build someone up than, than tear them down by mm-hmm. far, far, far and away. Because mm-hmm. once you've torn somebody down, how do you undo that quote unquote damage? Well, that's that's a topic that I think we could address. You know, just wanted to let the listeners know and you know, um, we have an hour to speak. Um, and if it flows into a second, you know, an hour and a half, that's fine. But I think this issue of, you know, how do we release the jabs that we've received from the outside world is something we we could leave to that latter part of the show. But moving on. Go ahead, Scott. You wanted to say something. And this is something we're dealing with within this chemtrail communities dynamic. Each and every one of us. All right, speak we about all, that a moment. Just, just all, go there. We all what do you bring mean? Our, we all bring our egos. We all bring our agendas. Mm-hmm. We all bring those things which stroke ourselves the way we like it. And if someone doesn't do that for this, for ourselves, in mm-hmm. a way that we expect, then we have issues. Mm-hmm. And this community was so small 15 years ago, and it has grown, you know, geometrically since that point in time, simply because the program is so old. Freaking obvious. Well, you know, I just can I just say one thing here, and that is that, I mean, it's something I've been thinking a lot about, and it's something that um, I'm personally, I mean, I recognize. I think it's important to recognize that everybody has an ego. You know, we just do, and but when it when it becomes dominant, and when it becomes, you know, that my work, let's say, you know, in in what I do for this movement, you know, if that if that starts, and I know it's gonna it's going to interact with my ego. But when that, when that, I like to kind of always put that in the back and really put the spiritual out in the front and really consider the other and, you know, do all the good things we're supposed to do because that egoic mentality causes nothing but pain and, um, and drama. And, you know, and I just see that in this movement, you know, there are leaders that have emerged and, you know, there are more and more of them and there's, and there many of them are such fantastic people. Yep. But, yep. but when the ego has become forefront, there, there is divisiveness. And so, as I was saying at the beginning, there's divisiveness sometimes based not on knowledge, but on kind of belief. And, um, so, so that's why I'm so excited really, because of course, this whole issue of, of ego is, it's important that we bring it into the forefront and that we maintain consciousness of it and not let it run the dialogue. But I think it's also, you know, to, to educate ourselves as activists. And that's why we are so lucky to hear from you. But please go on. Yeah, everybody has this. I won't say everybody because that's bad again in itself as an overstatement. But this right to be right. This right, R-I-T-E, to be R-I-G-H-T. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then mm-hmm. that's something that, because if you can admit that you're wrong, then you open yourself up to being right. And that <laughs> takes an act of humility. Yeah. And yeah. so many people are not willing to submit to the potential that they might be wrong. Mm-hmm. And that's how all advancement happens, is by that submission to what oh, is, it, 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 which is the, the greater, the more absolute truth, rather than seeing something from a relative truth. You know, through, mm-hmm. through you know, a, anyway, that we're, we're getting into the spirit. We're, get, we're digressing, I know. Yeah. So we'll going get, back, going back, we can, you know, yeah. I, I, you know, we can digress. If, if you're willing to take the time, I mean, it's fascinating, and I know that we have so much to cover. So please feel relaxed about digressing a little bit. But I, I, but let me bring you back. I can, you're, tell, you're, I'm here to, I can tell I'm here to 1 o'clock. So <laughs> All right. This is my, <laughs> and if you do stay, and this will be my first two-hour show, and I've actually been absolutely terrified to do that because <laughs> at the beginning, I mean, it's, it's just totally scary. How am I going to fill this time? You know, what if I don't have anything to say? But with you, I'm not afraid. Yeah. So that's great. Okay. So, but, but I, I want to bring you back to the weather station now. Yep. And, and you're, you know, you're, you're playing the, you know, you're, you're, you're guarding yourself against the politics. You're learning the ropes of the business. And what are you finding? That I love what I do. Mm-hmm. I love what I do. Mm-hmm. And then, and then talking to being, I, I, I just loved what I do. I did. Mm-hmm. So at that station in Topeka, in 10 months, I'd gone from the morning guy making, well, for, for two hours a day. That's all they hired me for was from 6 to 8 a.m. Oh, my God. I'm 6 to 8 a.m., you know, five days a week. I had to buy. At 3.35 an hour? <laughs> I think I was at five bucks an hour at this point. Okay. It would have been, uh, you know, 87 and 88. Okay. So the, the rate was just a little bit more generous. <laughs> you know, okay. inflation thing. Yeah. And 
so, but I still had to buy a car to commute to Topeka from Lawrence, Kansas. And so I still lost money on the deal. But I was getting experience, and the resume had, quote, unquote, begun. Mm -hmm. And that's what was important. Mm -hmm. So I'd moved from the morning to the weekend guy and then got the main job, you know, within like six months. And I was only there four months as the the primary five, six, and ten guy until I got a call from Omaha, Nebraska. And there was an agricultural satellite-based startup. Um, And the guy's name was Chad Myers, who gave me a call. And we talked. I came up and interviewed and got the job and started two weeks later. Chad Myers, as you may know, is now uh, one of the lead guys at CNN. Wow. I did not know that. Yep, Chad. So if you watch CNN's weather, Chad is there. Mm-hmm. He's one of their main guys. And so, you know, we've, we've got a history that goes back uh, to, to Omaha in the late 80s. Now, is Chad, you know, does he know about what's going on know. here? They all How know. No. They all know. Okay, go back. Would you go back, though, and tell us, you know, about... You know, when you started to kind of, okay, so you learned the ropes, you learned how to do weather, you were great at it, okay? Yeah. And then something happened. What happened that made you go, hey, what's going on here? My accuracy started to go down. Oh. Not as accurate as I had been in the past. Now, how did you base your your accuracy before, it, you know, when it was still good? What did you base it on? Was it computer modeling or what do you, what do weathermen assess the, you know, the weather on? Yeah, there's two ways to do that. And this came to my attention when I was in Tulsa. I was the morning guy in Tulsa. And uh, Gary Shore was, was the main meteorologist. Uh, the, the, Tulsa was a hot, hot weather hotbed. You know, the station had purchased its own, you know, $400,000 radar system. We had the best of everything. I mean, uh-huh. we had the best gear. Wow. And, and this was before the Internet, so there were storm chasers, tornado chasers go out, and in the weather center we would, you know, have phone conversations, two-way radio conversations with them to guide them because we had our own radar. We could see exactly where the storm was, what it looked like. You know, one day I showed up, and the chief engineer had purchased uh, NDL, or National Dot Lightning uh, d- Detection Network. And, and so we had a live feed of radar. We could see a blip show up on the screen and then hear the lightning outside. It was just that real Scott, time. Scott, can I, can I just stop you one second? Because I don't understand, and maybe some of our listeners don't understand either. Radar, radar works with sound waves, is that right? I mean, can you explain? Pardon me? Microwaves. Microwaves, Micro- okay. Could you, and that's what scalar is when we no, talk scalar, no, no, no. no, this is just this is just C band C band microwaves. They just go out and they're they're tuned to see the water molecule, and so we'll get an echo, we'll get a reflection when when it hits when it hits the oh, water okay. molecule. Okay, all right. Ice, then you get a if it's hail, if it's ice, you get a, a greater reflection. If you get okay. snow, then it's a softer reflection. But wow. Yeah, so it's just. You know, we had our own freaking. But then, how would the radar? How would it transmit back to the weather station what it was finding? So you um, send the radar out. How does it come back? How does the cop know you're speeding? I don't think it, because it's radar. But I never knew what that meant, really. No, you know, it just means that he's sending a, a, a focused beam and mm-hmm. it hits your car, and it's essentially the speed of light that radar that frequency is bounced back to his detector, and so he knows. At the speed bounces. Of light All right. Your speed. So, is is the microwave energy operating at the speed of light? Is it light energy? When we say microwave, is that is that the same as light? No, it's, it's just a, it's just a wave that is emitted and then broadcast out. And if if it doesn't see anything, if it doesn't see a cloud, then it just is lost. There's no echo. It's like you're speaking in a gotcha. you know, boom, and you're or the Grand Canyon, and you get an echo back. Okay, and, and so the, the the imprinting of that echo determines yeah. whether we're looking at, at water or cloud or snow or whatever, right? Or birds, yeah. Yeah, or birds. Okay, okay, yeah. back to you. Then so um, and you... So in, in Tulsa, I was the morning guy. Okay. Uh, the main guy was, you know, was, was the deep into six figure, and I was the guy making a fraction of that but doing so much work. And I'm like, damn it. <laughs> but anyway... And so I would come in in the mornings and I'd look at Gary's forecast and go, what is he smoking? What is this dude smoking? And I would tweak his forecast. I mean, big time. I would jack up Thursday's high by eight, nine degrees. Why? Just, why? Because of the radar signatures that you're getting back? No, or why? I, I'm looking at the computer models. And so I, I think I see this, this warm front up here before, before the end of the day. If this warm front makes it as far north as Tulsa, northeastern Oklahoma, then we're not going to stay at 55. We're going to 71. Okay. And that's a 12, 13 degree difference. Yeah. And so, 
I'm like, I, I can't bust what people will know. I mean, just stepping outside of the cars that were in the 70s versus the upper 50s. That's right. a big difference. And so I, there was an intuitive aspect of how I learned to forecast. Right. And I also learned to forecast at the extreme. Because the effect of busting a forecast by playing the middle road was an error of five, six, seven, eight degrees. So I no wait. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, Be- <laughs> okay. Before we before we go too much into forecasting, which as interesting as it is, I just want to make sure that that um, that we frame this within the goal of your eureka moment of exactly. what the hell is going on. So we're sitting there. Okay, we're, we're finishing a, a thought. Okay, a, a thought. okay, sorry. So the point was. Gary was a little annoyed that I was changing his forecast wholesale. So he had him, he told the weekend guy to start checking our accuracy. Okay, but wait, why were you, you were changing it because the sky was doing funny things? Is that why you were changing it? Because I was seeing a different solution in the data that was, was given to me, the fax maps, the, the forecast models. Was right, but was this pre-chemtrail? Was this before the no, no, this? No, no, no. Engineering had happened in the 70s. I have never worked a single day in this career without geoengineering going on. Wow. Straight up. Straight up. And that was 30 years ago that I began. But it's increased, obviously, like manifold. Is that right? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Sure. sure. So you're like a, a, a sculptor putting together a, 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 sculpture, a sculpting of David. And you begin by carving off chunks of the block. Right. This is how the accuracy has changed over the years. It has gotten far, far more refined. So, is the geoengineering? How does the geoengineering affect the accuracy? Because, as you know, on Otis, you know, at five o'clock it's going to begin to rain, and pretty much at five o'clock it begins to rain. That never used to happen. So yes. I'm wondering, is it is the geoengineering making the weather mapping clearer? This goes back to my accuracy changing. Okay. So, so Glenn had been dealing with my accuracy, and, and when Gary found out after a year of checking our forecast, out of 12 forecast periods, I was beating everybody in 10 of them. Hmm. 10 of them. And because? So, because why? I was it your intuition, or, or yeah. were you on to... Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, and I didn't realize that the game was rigged at this point, but okay. I learned how to play the game not okay. knowing that I was playing a game. I thought I was forecasting what Mother Nature was doing. I had just learned to forecast the extremes of whatever event was coming. Either you were going to get a flooding event or you are going to get a drought event. You were going to get a trace of rain or you are going to get two inches of rain. It was one or the other. Why? In Why the was there so much extremes? Why? That's what geoengineering. That is the image. Okay. Okay. That's what I wanted you to say. So why does, how does geoengineering, I mean, obviously, we're getting more and more extreme weather. And, and it's presumably you're saying it's because of geoengineering. Yeah. Why does the ge- why does the geoengineering do this? And why would they want to do this? Is this part of what they want to do? Yeah. There's an agenda, and, and you obviously, and I think every one of your listeners knows that for California is under a drought agenda. We're under a drought agenda, but I'll tell you something: we're being flooded right now. We it is raining and raining and raining. So what's that about? But you're in Northern California. I'm in Northern California, and it's it's raining a lot is then you've got your localized seasonal rains. Is it cold enough that the snowpack is building? Yes. I think no? it is, yeah. Okay. And, you know, and, and I, I did a quick scan of the models today. I didn't see an event. Well, I, I'm seeing these, these storms come through, but I'm not seeing the cold event until, honestly, it's, it's now 12, 13, 14 days away. And that, that's assuming that there isn't any geoengineering happening, and we all know that's not the case. Right. That, that would bring the snow levels down to 2,000 feet, mm-hmm. or maybe eight or nine or 10,000 feet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and that plays directly into the sustainability of the spring runoff. We've got to have cold storm after cold storm after cold storm to build the snowpack up to what is, what is normal, not even mm-hmm. to, a, to a Yeah, you're right. You're right. And so, so back, that, that, okay, so back to your, you're predicting, you know, you, the extremes and you're back there and then what happened? And then what happened? Um, we're going to fast forward, you know, two other jobs. Okay. Okay. Both to Albany, New York, and then back to Idaho. I just love the West. The, the West is home. Yeah. And so it was the late 90s. And you know, I, I'm reading the national, as, as I do my work, you know, I, because the internet is such a beautiful thing. It, 
allowed me to do so much of my prep work before I would go into work. I could, you know, sit down at the computer and read the discussions coming out of, uh, out of, uh, well, at that point in time, it was called the National Centers for Environmental Prediction, or the Hydro Meteorological Prediction Center, the HPC. And so they'll give short range discussions and long range discussions because they've got, they have access to all of the models, whether the European, Canadian, or American systems. Mm-hmm. They review all of them, overlay them on top of each other, and see which one provides the most reasonable or logical solutions. But day after day after month after year, you know, 97, 98, 99, 2000, um, they were in the Pacific talking about low confidence forecasts, meaning we don't know what's going to happen. We have an idea, and we're going to give you our best guess. However, don't take it to the bank. And during this time, the storm would, say, come ashore, California, Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, whatever, transition across Idaho, which is which is kind of an arid state. You know, there's a couple of mountain ranges between the Pacific. you got the, the coastal range, the, 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 the Sierra Cascades, and then some of the, the bitter roots in Idaho and, and so forth. And so there was plenty of opportunity for these storms to get stripped of their moisture by the time they would get to the Snake River Plain where I was located. And these storms were forecast two, four, five, six, seven, eight inches worth of snow. We'd get a trace. We'd get one. Would, We'd get really? One. And I'm like, well, what's going on? Because I have to then explain to my audience, to the road department, to the highway patrol, mm-hmm. to the school bus drivers, to mm-hmm. the school districts, to mm-hmm. the ski resorts, to the power companies. All of these different kind of entities were keenly interested on the weather, and they would watch me and the other guys. Mm-hmm. And so I have a responsibility to be right, to be right. Otherwise, they're going to go, I'm going to go shop Channel 8. I'm going to go look at Channel 3. I'm going to watch someone else who can give me the accurate forecast. Right. So the hierarchy is the computer models generate a forecast. The weather service looks at those, gives them their best guess. I and the media try to improve upon what the weather service does. So there's this constant refinement of the forecast. So are you telling me that in the olden days, you know, when weathermen would give their forecasts, they would give them pretty much on natural movements of weather. And that was, so they could be pretty, I mean, you were saying it wasn't so accurate in the past, but, you know, pretty much there weren't surprises. But with the geoengineering coming, are you saying that um, there would be changes that most people didn't really know were into the mix. In other words, it's like a recipe where, you know, you're expecting one thing, but somebody is secretly adding some other yep. ingredient. Is that what you're saying? And I call it the delta factor. Delta. When you're, when you're in mathematics, delta is a change in value. Uh-huh. Something changes. Right. That delta factor, that right. variable that is undefinable, is unquantifiable until the event is over. Okay. And this is what I was realizing was happening in 2002. By 2002, I had read enough Rents.com, Coast to Coast AM, and right. these other conspiracy sites of the term chemtrail. And so I would follow that because, bloody hell, you're dealing with my science. You know, exactly, I, I, exactly. I, yeah, I want to know. Right. And, and I approached this as this is my holy grail. This is, this is my sacred cow. Do not bring conspiracy into meteorology, into weather, into climate. Let this right. science be pure. And so I held it at arm's length. I honestly did because the stories I would read, the people were, and I, 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 I'm being kind, clueless about weather, clueless about cloud names. And so it, it it was very, and everything was bombastic. They're killing us. They're poisoning us. I'm like, that's just crap. If they want to kill us, they'll de- they'll do it via the food. They'll de- deal with it via terrorism or anthrax or something like that. If they want a hard kill, that's what they'll do it. That's right. how they'll do it. They won't spend trillions of dollars buying aircraft and doing this stuff in the sky. The programs are completely irrelevant, and one has a... Uh, an, an amorphous or very weak impact on 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 one's health. So, I, so you were saying you hold on. You were thinking that at the time um, that before. In other words, you probably weren't familiar. Um, maybe Clifford Carnicom hadn't really, you know, no, under his, his site was big. His site was big. Right, but so that are you saying? Are you saying that that you, I mean, you you did say that 
you thought at that time that a lot of the conspiracy theorist type people, you know, like us, people investigating, were basically we didn't know what we were talking about. Yeah, yeah. We okay, we were we were thinking it was, but no, but are you? But then did I you didn't find bite that out? Lure. I did I'm not sorry? bite that lure. I didn't bite the lure. I I had to see. I needed a motive. I needed a clear and concise motive. Wait, and explain explain, explain what you mean because I'm getting a little bit lost here. So you needed a motive for what? For the planes. Why would there be so many planes? Okay, okay. So you... Hazardly, you know, air pattern. Okay, okay. I, need, I needed a motive. Mm -hmm. And without a motive, I couldn't, I couldn't ascertain or uh, apply a cause. You have to have a motive. But wait a minute. The geoengineering that had been happening since the 70s, and maybe from before, that was all happening through planes. Is that right? Yes and no. Yes and no. And okay. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. So, but there was some, there was plane activity before, and the motives were this geoengineer. Okay, I guess I'm getting a little bit confused, and yeah, forgive me. I'm just going to let you talk for a while yeah. then about. At this point, it's 2002. I had just okay. come across Clifford Carnicom's work on right. scalar energy. Mm -hmm. my, my, my reason for getting interested in Clifford Carnicom was free energy. You know, we were being bombarded with global warming. I'm like, well, crap, you know, let's quit burning oil then. You know, there are a solution. You know, we've had all of these inventors come along with electric cars, free energy devices, uh, Tesla, energy from the vacuum, wireless energy. There are a ton, I mean, literally thousands of classified documents which could solve an energy issue or the climate CO2 slash issue in five years' time. Mm -hmm. In five years' time, this issue could be done. Okay, can we can we just, I think we, you know what I think is going to happen here during this interview? I think what's going to happen is that, some of these topics are just begging the question now, and so I'm going to interrupt the flow of your life story for just a moment, or maybe for just a few moments. What is your stance right now on global warming? Is it happening? Is it not happening? Is it a natural cycle? Is it being induced by the we'll powers get there. that be? We'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get there. Okay, because we'll there. But, but but you're saying at that time. You believed it was it was natural, or you I, know, I was going out and talking to sixth graders, third graders, fourth graders, talking about global warming and this and, and all of this. I was hook like a okay. blind sinker into the mainstream. I was doing what okay. any good weather okay. was supposed to be okay. doing. All right, go ahead. Um, because I didn't know what was really going on. Okay, what was really happening, and so I, I'm I'm into Bearden's work, and he's got this sidebar on his website called Soviet Weather Engineering. I'm like, oh, what's this all about? And this is Tom Bearden? You, that Tom you, Bearden. And, and who so is he? He's a, a nuclear physicist who was in Army Intelligence. Okay. And and he was, it was his office that briefed Reagan on, on the Soviet scalar weather engineering that was, that had been happening since uh, the 70s. Okay. So okay. It, it's the executive branch of government was clueless this was happening, even though it had been ongoing for the better part of 20 years. Mm-hmm. So that's how compartmentalized the information is. Wow. On Bearden's site, there were, there were pictures of clouds that had patterns, grids, radials, uh, just just things that you wouldn't find in a free-flowing fluid, be that, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. fluid gas or gaseous or, or liquid in nature, because they both behave the same when it, when it comes to, to dynamics or, you know, fluid dynamics. They're going to behave the same. Everything's going to curl. Everything's going to be round. And we're finding squares cubes and gridded patterns mm -hmm. it meant that there had been some kind of pattern overlaid upon the fluid motions of the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. so I bought a digital camera and started taking pictures. And mm -hmm. that's when my eyes truly were open day after day after day after day. Mm -hmm. And by 03, I was convinced something was happening, convinced. Mm -hmm. And I was starting to share, shared with my friends at the weather service, shared with the other meteorologists within the market. You know, mm -hmm. I was not bashful about it in the least. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was sharing. But I still didn't know where chemtrails fit in this program. So by 04, I subscribed to some high-resolution satellite imagery, weathertap.com. It costs 8 bucks a month, and then you can click and save and click and save. And that was something that I couldn't do with, with the government satellite data. It was just too coarse, too low resolution, mm -hmm. that I had to go to a private service. Mm -hmm. And so by June of 6, there was one, it was a Sunday evening, I remember it very clearly, I'd saved the picture and zoomed in, zoomed in, zoomed in. And there was a weak cool front up in Montana. And we know Montana, especially western Montana, is riddled with mountain ranges. Mm -hmm. And we're taught that clouds develop atop the mountains, you know, where the orographic lift is greatest and the instability is the greatest and the 
potential buoyancy, you know, you know all of this thermodynamic BS is there. Not that there isn't a place for it, it's just that it's not the overriding factor in weather any longer. Mm. And there were squares. There was a square <gasps> shadow over Billings, Montana. Oh, my God. I'm like, oh, that's curious. <laughs> And then, you know, to to the left, because the sun was setting, um, was the square cloud casting the shadow. I'm like, oh, crap. And then I examined the imagery a little bit more. And it looked like this innocuous cold front had been cut up like, a, you know, a loaf of sliced bread. Wow. And out of the lower edge of it was this, this square missing, just like on a chessboard, this black cube was that was missing. And it was the exact same size and shape as the square cloud that was sitting over Montana, over Billings, Montana. Wow. And that's when I realized that we're not dealing with just hurricanes. We're not dealing with just, you know, manipulating storms to deal or to extend a drought in some location. But the entire planet's weather had been, quote-unquote, digitized, mm. meaning weather was stepped from segment to segment to segment as, as this these wave patterns were adjusted little bit by little bit by little bit as the weather was stepped, you know, from state to state to state. And so, I, uh, my gut sank. I'm like, oh, crap. You know, mm-hmm. how can I forecast this? Mm-hmm. How can I do this? Mm-hmm. I don't know what's going to happen. This quote-unquote delta factor just got immense. Mm-hmm. It, it, it approached, you know, instead of a point zero one or a low factor, it approached one meaning it changes everything. Mm-hmm. I still didn't know where Tim Trill sped into it. So uh, by uh, 04, so, uh, October of 04, a guy by the name of George Year, who has a website called urbansurvival.com, and he is the people's economist. And, you know, it was stuff, you know, economics has always been a fascinating thing for me. When I even got to, to university, I didn't know whether it was going to do meteorology or, or economics. And mm-hmm. It was just that evenly divided for me. Mm-hmm. I just loved it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he asked the open question, could scalar weapons have been used to accentuate the hurricane season in Florida in, back in 2004 when Florida was just hammered by storms? Mm-hmm. And so I, I read this early in the morning and kind of sat with that question all day long because I knew if I wrote him a missive, a response, that he would publish it. Mm-hmm. And at that point in time, I would then be on the radar. I would be out and open. But mm-hmm. I had already realized that I can't forecast anymore, especially not and, and not tell my audience what's really happening. So I got, got home from work that night, and I just started writing. I said, well, let's see what comes out of me. So I, I wrote it up and added pictures and descriptions, because and, I'd been archiving imagery for, for probably two years by then, just because I found it so fascinating. And I emailed George. He published it the next morning. Before that day was out, my general manager probably had a dozen phone calls. Mm-hmm. Is Scott Stevens an employee of yours? Yes or no? And and so then <laughs> Bill Bill Fouch was my, my general manager, and he came back to Scott, what happened? But I told him. I told him. And he said, all right, all right, I'll stand with you. I'll stand with you. Just keep it on your time. You know, do these things on your time and just keep it off our air and, and you're fine. Mm-hmm. And it, that worked for 11 months. And so I still reading, seeing these Kim Trump stories and I thought, I got to figure this baby out. I got to figure it out. Um, by August or three months later, there was this, it was a beautiful summer afternoon, blue sky. And I'm standing out on the front yard, you know, talking to one of my neighbors and I see a, a 747, you know, coming from the Northeast to the Southwest, bright green paint screen team and low and slow. I'm like, this isn't right. This is not right. He's, he's not coming from there. There's no there's no big airports to support a 747 up in Montana or Wyoming or North Dakota or Saskatchewan. That's just, that's crap. Mm-hmm. Just crap. He's out of flight path. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, that's a chemtrail. That's a chemtrail. So a couple months later, I bought four cameras, two computers, and some time-lapse software and started time-lapsing this guy. The computers would turn on at first light. And turn off at sunset. I would come. So up. wait, can I ask you a question? Was it just that the flight path for the 747 was totally inappropriate, or was it that you were seeing this big chemtrail coming out the back of it? All of the above. Okay. Was that that wasn't the first chemtrail you'd ever seen, or was no, it? No, no, no. I had pictures of them for three years before. Okay. Okay. I, and I was aware of them before. Okay. You know, Are, you you just you just one of the things I. 
promised myself was not to judge any information as being bad, but just out of context. Okay, and that's so good. Every bit of information is, yeah. is a pixel on a, on a screen, on a picture, right. and it has a color and a brightness. And if you assemble enough of these pixels, you'll end up getting the whole picture. Wow. So mm -hmm. Don't discard information, just file it away. Right. And so that, that was my premise, and that's how I approached this, this, this program. Mm -hmm. So I bought those cameras in the beginning of 2005. By April of 5, I had caught a series of flights. It was an April afternoon, and um, it was one of my lower lower resolution Logitech orbit webcams um, looking across the southwest. And I caught a series of flights that happened in about 15 minutes. All of those flights, except for one, had relatively short trails. They had to have trails or I wouldn't have seen the plane. The, you know, the resolution of the cameras was not that good in that, at that point in time. Mm -hmm. But one of the trails persisted. Two other flights came along, and one of them intersected the segment of the trail that persisted in the exact center, and the other one on the edge, the, the, the exact edge. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, it's all about geometry. It's all about geometry. And how, how, long, how long afterwards did the, did the second and third plane come? After you saw the first chemtrail, inside of six minutes. Okay. Inside. Go ahead. Okay. So as I as I saw this example repeated since then, tens of thousands of times, mm -hmm. tens of thousands of times. Mm -hmm. Every trail, like like you started the show with, and I'd forgotten I'd written that thing about the chessboard. Mm -hmm. Segments of the atmosphere are representative of aspects of wave patterns that are are introduced via via scalar via pulses from harp where you lift and then, then slam back down the ionosphere, just like dropping a... a so would you define yeah. scalar now? Just tell us what is scalar. What does that mean? We're dealing with dimensional technologies. We're dealing with the ability to open up one realm into the other and draw energy from one realm into this one or take energy from this realm and park it in the other. So when you say realm and when you say dimension, could you please define those for us? Just interchangeable. Okay, it's, what, what does it mean? It's a reality that is out of phase of, of the one that you can see with your senses. You know, NASA has probably said it best. And and they call it dark energy or dark matter. And they, they, they said with all of our telescopes, all of our instrumentation, we have only been able to observe 5% of the universe. The rest is unobservable to us. All so are you saying that there's some kind of an impulse here, really, um, which we could even call mystical, to move from energy from one dimension into our, you know, three dimensions here? Are you saying that? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, uh, can you speak about that? Or like, wow, <laughs> you know, like you, we talked last night and you kind of blew my brains out by saying that. Like, yep. what are you saying? What What's that? What I'm saying is I'm going to go right back to Tom Beard. Okay. And, and his big aha was seeing these chimneys, these big, fat, like Three Mile Island nuclear-powered chimneys, except much, much larger in the Soviet Arctic, mm -hmm. in Siberia. Mm -hmm. And they're venting untold BTUs or amounts of heat into the, into the Arctic, leaving plumes of steam that were hundreds of miles long. Wow. And, and as he's analyzing this Im Im imagery, like, where is the heat coming from? Where is this quantity of heat being drawn from and then exhausted to? Where is it yeah. coming from? Where? And it's coming from this realm or another realm and being changed. So in his work, scalar interferometry, you have two antenna. And when these antenna cross or these these it's like two different radar beams but not with with frequencies that we can measure, when they intersect, then there's an interference pattern. Mm -hmm. And then in that interference pattern, you can have two modes. Exothermic mode, meaning you drop heat into this interference pattern, which can be two, three, four miles across, or 80 or 100 or two, 300 miles across in size. And so you're going to have a warming effect on the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. If you go the other mode, endothermic mode, you're re retrieving heat from that zone of the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Now, if you retreat, a re a retrieve heat or cool the atmosphere above a hurricane, its convective potential goes up. Mm. And so the atmosphere becomes inherently unstable. And so the thunderstorms are going to develop explosively. Wow. So you're saying that by the manipulation of heat, one way or the other, 
this is the mechanism through which the scalar technology controls the weather? Then you get action at a distance. You get action at a distance. So those, those interferometers can be in Siberia and then spin up a thunderstorm over southern Illinois. You now, interferometers, are these part of... You know, are, are these kind of localized or are this, you know, we talk, we hear about HARP, of course, and we know that there are many, you know, several, I don't know, maybe 20, 25, maybe 30, 40 of such facilities around the planet. Mm-hmm. Is that what, is that the generator for no, no, this? No, no, no. no, no. 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 Okay. If you're going to build a house and the mm-hmm. analogy is control the, control the weather, you're building a house. Mm-hmm. How many tools does the craftsman come when he builds a house? A lot. Oh, well, he doesn't come with a hammer and nails. Or, or just a, a, a ruler and and <laughs> and a screwdriver. <laughs> okay. Come with many tools. Right. And so this is this is the same program. We don't have just harp. We don't have just scalar technology. We've got many different tools. Wow. But regardless, you all need some source of measurement so you get straight lines. So you cut that two by four with the right angle at the end to, to be the proper joist to hold up the roof. Mm-hmm. This is what the chemtrails do. They are your measuring and your sighting. Are you kidding me? This is what they do. Holy crap! Could you could you please like you know like explain that more, please? So one of my videos on YouTube is called "Weather uh, Chemtrails as the Weather Draftsman," and that's oh. essentially you, you, there is technology. I know everybody's stuck on this harp thing. You know, please let it go, please. You know, it may be 10, 15% of what's really happening. Wow. The technology is small enough and uses wattages low enough that they can be on Learjet, on Gulfstream planes, really? on commercial aircraft. And so that you have these mobile antenna able wow. to fly, fly in angles up, you know, up to 40,000 feet, down to 18,000 feet, and create these geometric patterns just like threading weaves in the sky. And then you leave the trail behind so the result of what is happening can be observed by satellites in space. And then the patterns measured off by another plane coming along behind it and hitting where the trail changes or crosses one of those blocks on the chessboard precisely. So when, what, what again, can you just repeat because I've already, my mind lost it. The chemtrails are, is the architecture that is measuring exactly what again, please? In measure, in measuring how the atmosphere is, is essentially being deformed. Deformed can be defined a couple of ways. It's moving in four dimensions. So is it expanding? Is it contracting? Is it moving to the east? Because almost all weather in this hemisphere moves from, from west to east. So is that segment of the atmosphere moving from the west to the east more slowly than the surrounding units? But are they just wanting to know this to do... Weather modeling? Why do they want to know this? Oh, you're brilliant. You're brilliant. Why? That's it exactly. But they already can do. I mean, who cares? All right, that was kind of this question I was like wanting to ask you is, why do we want to know so much about the weather? I mean, I know that there's economic ramifications, of course. Mm-hmm. You know, I know that there are practical things that we need to understand in order to make plans, you know, and I know that we want to necessarily modify something bad that's coming like a hurricane. God, it forget. I think we're going to take a station break. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, we'll be right back. Every breath we take, geoengineering is a grave mistake. Bluer than blue, that's how the sky was. Whiter than white. Well, I do have to say I love singing along to that song. And, uh, you know, as a, as a musician, to take the sky in, um, I was so happy to be able to bring it into song. And I hope to do more of that. And, Scott, um, I'm reading from Chemtrails 101 on your uh, on your weatherwars.info. And I'd like to begin the second segment with this. But this is a quote from you. The contrails are flown to map the sky of these scalar electromagnetic energy signatures and to make what is invisible visible. It's that simple. 
This is almost the sole reason for the chemtrails. And this is just where we are. So you were just explaining this point. So please take us further. We've all got a library of, of these pictures. <clears throat> At some point in our in our investigation of this phenomena to decide for ourselves whether it's conspiracy or it's fact, we've archived imagery. Mm-hmm. And I would challenge challenge you to go back and look through your library of pictures. And on those pictures where there are two or more chemtrails in in, in evidence, mm-hmm. that that will you <laughs> where one plane will cross another's trail. Mm-hmm. At that intersection point, the, the trail that is being intersected will have a different appearance, whether it's fatter, whether it disappears, whether it, it has some kind of deformation or perturbation will show up at that exact point. Mm-hmm. So go back and look through your imagery with this in mind, that these intersection points will define precisely where there is a change in how that previous chemtrail is behaving. And, I mean, I I saw it today, looking out my western window where I've got my GoPro uh, time-lapsing. You know, rare, 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 rare is the chemtrail that will stay uniform, meaning pencil-like straight in and pencil-like uniformity for more than 10 seconds. So I just assumed, and I think many of us, okay, just assumed. Yeah, that, I know, right? Never assume one of the four Yeah, rules. right, right, right. <laughs> but so but anyway, we do assume, you know, okay, the, the, we watch as the chemtrail or the aerosol dissipates, and we think, okay, it's forming cloud cover, mm-hmm. and it's the cloud cover itself, because we know that when enough of these happen, our sky gets whitened. Mm-hmm. So can you speak about, and I don't want to take you away from where you're going, but no, no, no. It's but, but it's so the, the sky whitens uh, as a result of these aerosols. Yeah. Are you saying that's simply kind of a byproduct of this technology, no, no, no. or is that the goal in some way? It, it, it's, it's part of the agenda. It's absolutely part of the agenda. Um, because then the, the goal is once you have grip, and this is what happens. You have grip on the atmosphere, on the water molecule, on the nitrogen. When you have these particles, these nanoparticles, these metallic particles in a great enough quantity in the sky, then you have some grip for the electrical energies that are on these planes, that are in space, that are from the harp apparatuses, from the scalar t- tools, to then pull the atmosphere gently, 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 a little bit at a time, a little bit now, you know, in the direction that you want it to go. And also, so that if you want to change the ionization of a column of the atmosphere, you you know, like you're going to core a pineapple, just you just pull the core right on out, that this is how they'll inhibit rainfall. Once you have the atmosphere doped up with these metals, then you hit it with an ionization pulse, and this is where the harp comes in. And then that essentially just takes the oomph out of the droplet formation process. Okay, wait a minute. So we've got the, you know, it's interesting because you talked about ionization. Mm -hmm. And and then, of course, we hear about harp and how it heats the ionosphere. So Mm -hmm. the ions are charged particles. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So um, could you, I mean. Polarity and the water won't collect. The water Say it again. Season, it's, the, all you have to do is change the polarity, and then the water molecule will not co- will not collect. It just stays in vapor form. And if the water molecule cannot condense or collect itself, then it won't grow to the size that's necessary to then create rainfall. Mm-hmm. So you end up with these storms, these constant storms. So many of them in the West are just this diffuse mess. The definition of the cloud bases is absent. You've got this just this gray looking uniform, you know, looking cloud or, or, you know, sky. So, but here's the thing. We have at least a double uh, intention going on. On the one hand, you were saying that these aerosol trails, chemtrails, are being used to map Mm -hmm. atmospheric conditions. But on the other hand, they're actually changing them and changing them very vigorously. So those are two different things. Can you address that? Yeah, you've got multiple purposes for for the trails. And then once you, you're dealing with the mapping, then the planes come in low and slow. And then then that's when the electronics are all Oh, on. so in other words, the initial stage might be, hey, we're just trying to figure out what we need to do here, and then we're going to do it. Is that right? 
Okay. And, and it's not so much they're trying to figure it out. They've got artificial intelligence computers that are just light years ahead of anything you and I can conceive. Wow. So what's, you know, the solution they want? Maybe the solution is a Hurricane Sandy type of event. And they say, we need a hurricane. We need, we need a mid-Atlantic, lower New England, big coastal event on or about this particular day. Oh, wait a minute. So are we saying we, and that, cause I was also wanting to bring in the international scope of this and how all the different air forces around the globe are wanting to do this and are doing it. Mm-hmm. And what I'm wondering is, you know, is we, in the case of, an, uh, of Sandy or, you know, another devastating tornado, is that we somebody else or is that we the Americans doing it to themselves? And if so, why? There's no, there's no nationalities. It's it's the super we that, that we are just a part of. We are we are we are no more. America is no more than one piece. Well, you know, one game piece on the chessboard. So, but but if it's happening here, though, what I mean is, hmm. is the American Weather Service, military, whatever, are we the ones perpetrating it, or is it the Russians, or are we doing it over there and they're doing it over here, or are we in charge of our own airspace? It's called corporations. It's so, not government. Okay. It's corporations given the explicit permission by the government, by the big government, by the big, the we government. So corporations like you know Raytheon and Raytheon, I can't... Honeywell, Dow Chemical, Lear, Learjet, and Airbus, and Boeing, and, and and just the whole kit and caboodle of the military-industrial communications complex. So the military then is what contracting with these companies, or is it how? And it's always been that way. It's mm-hmm. always been that way. It's mm-hmm. just, you know, it, the, the, the only solution to this, Kate, is to end the Fed. End the source of money that these pigs feed upon. That's the only way it ends. God, it is really, it is, it is such a witch's brew, isn't it? I mean... You and I talking about it only brings more people up to speed on the issue and how deep and pervasive it is. When the- Can you unpack that a little bit for, for, for me and for our listeners, how the economic side of it is fed into making it all happen and kind of feeding upon itself like a giant monster? Well, for, for, for me, I, I'm going to go back. You know, okay, 50, 50, go back. <laughs> you know, and, and it, was, it was the global warming issue. So the Please. whole purpose of global warming was to cast carbon dioxide as the bad guy. Carbon dioxide is something that we apparently can't wean ourselves off off of, even though there are thousands of patents and quote unquote national security related issues end quote that would end our CO two and our petrol do- our petrol uh, addiction. So they're going to say we've got a problem with CO two, but yet not provide the solution which would end it instantaneously. Thereby, we don't have a problem with CO two in any regard. That's that that's the false flag right there is CO two. Wait a minute. You just said something that I didn't follow. You said that there is CO2 and that there are um, there's a lot of uh, ways that we could resolve that, but it's not being brought to market. Therefore, then you said, therefore, we don't have a problem with CO2. What did you mean by that? Because if we really had a CO2 problem, then we would they would roll out the solution oh. because it would be for the betterment of all. CO2 oh. is simply plant fertilizer. Yeah, that's all it is. It's CO2. Okay. You go to any greenhouse, any greenhouse. And they will burn petroleum, they'll burn propane or just, so that the plants are healthier. The yield is bigger. Mm-hmm. I mean, it happens all over. CO2 is plant fertilizer. You, mm-hmm. and, I, you and I are CO2 manufacturing. Right, right, right. You know, right. it's part of the natural process. So CO2 is not the problem. Mm-hmm. So thereby, global warming isn't the problem either. Mm. Climate varies naturally. Mm-hmm. We're at the end of a, of a 10,000 year long warming period that is going to end just like clockwork. It always has, it always will. It's mm-hmm. a function of cycles of the sun and orbital mechanics. It's going to end with Ice Age. So, the real agenda, in my opinion, mm-hmm. is that we're continuing, we're trying to delay the eventual descent into an Ice Age. We're trying to keep the planet warm. That oh, is the cool. goal. That's the goal. Wow. So, like, can we just stop a moment? Like, let, let's just, like, you know, bring out some champagne and, like, yeah. what, what? So you're saying that we are moving from a natural warming. We're going to be moving into a, a natural 
very cooling. kind of devastating cooling. I, I read also on your website that you said that 10 years of such a cooling phase in the, you know, pre- made an ice age that lasted 1300 years. Is that the same kind of thing we're looking at now? I don't know how long it'll last. I, I think some of the solar scientists are figuring out that the sun is going quiet. So they know that an ice age, they know that a cooling they period know. is coming? Oh yeah, they know. they know. So, okay, but they're, they're lying now. You know, we're talking about COP21. What have they ever told the truth? Well, never. But I mean, so, so they're telling us that we are going to be looking at geoengineering to prevent global warming from, you know, continuing to ameliorate it. But in actuality, they may be proposing further geoengineering in order to stave off the coming cooling. Is that what the truth is? Exactly. Oh, okay. And the other thing is, and this is kind of was my first line of, of thought and reasoning when, when I came to terms, you know, 10, 12 years ago with what was happening is because the geoengineering is happening, because the chemtrail program is present, because of the, all the artificial clouds that have been manufactured by this program, we do not know where <laughs> the planet really is headed as far as temperature. Bingo. Okay. This is what Michael Murphy is doing his whole new film on and also Dr. Marvin Herndon. And they're saying we cannot really have accurate climate models because we've been messing with things for so long. I Would you? To, yep. And I told him to go down that road, that that needed to be his next topic. Wow. Yep. Okay. So, so then but what's happening in the Arctic? What's happening <laughs> in the Arctic? Is it intentionally being melted so we can get our oil no, from no, no, no. the Arctic? It what's happens. Going on? It happens. And that will be the final phase when we when we descend into the ice ages, when the Arctic finally melts, when it's finally free of ice. Holy mackerel! That, Are that, you that, serious? That's like, that that is like the you know when you're canning your 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 fruit and you're using a pressure cooker, the steam comes off the top. Right. And so that that's the regulating mechanism is the Arctic finally opens up completely, and when the ice age descends then that can vapor, all of that moisture can come off the top of the planet and then reglaciate the north, the, the mid-latitude. Wow. That's how it's always happened. Oh, my God. Could you explain that, please, for our listeners, exactly how it's always happened and, and, and you know, how this, this apple of our planet then cooks in this yeah. way or isons in this way? How does that happen? You know, and, and we're, we're so concerned about the animals up there. You know, it, I, I, I get it. I get it. You can get emotionally attached to those kind of things. Right. But life is eternal. Wow. And, and I wouldn't want to be a polar bear forever. Come on, there's other, other life <laughs> to have to, and, and to become yeah. evolve into. Mm-hmm. You know, same with the penguins and so forth and so on. Everything is in this state temporarily. Mm-hmm. And so we have to get detached from this assumption that we are in a steady state creation. Creation changes. So wait a minute. Why, why won't they? I'm so sorry to ask you this in the middle of what you're saying. Forgive me. Go on and I'll, I'll hold my tongue. Well, no, it's just, if you go back to the, the climate research of the fifties, which was brilliant and they were, they were free and open to, to think and explore and, and deal with different concepts in a way that science is restricted by funding in these days. You cannot get a, a climate paper published that does not come to the politically ascribed or a prescribed solution. You know, you, you have to come to the conclusion that climate change is, is man-made. Mm. Otherwise, you don't get published. Mm. It, it, that, that. It's so fucked up. I'm sorry, I'm just going to say yeah, it. No, it's, it's, an it's so stuff. fucked up. Yeah. You know, it's like we don't have science anymore. We don't. We have political prescriptions that scientists must, must bolster and support. And it's, it's, it's the deadening of science. I was just talking to Dr. Herndon about this, and it's a very interesting story, which we'll have on our show another time. But he completely, you know, has experienced it as a scientist. But my question is, and I was, which I was chomping at the bit to ask you is, why keep this a secret? Like, why is it, in other words, is global warming and the terror that they are bringing upon us all and the carbon credits and all of that, is that so much better for us to think about than the fact that we're entering a, co- a cooling period? What's well, the deal? The whole CO2 issue is, is, is financially related. It comes back to Goldman Sachs, which would be one of the, one of the points for the carbon trading. At any time, uh, a unit, whether it's a stock, whether it's a currency, whether it's, it's something of value, a unit of exchange goes through these banks, they take their piece of it. 
And so if you can impose this tax by the ton, and there are billions of tons of this floating around uh, exchange between persons, between, between companies, between governments, then the financial centers reap this imaginary, well, value off the exchange of these, of these credits. Mm-hmm. So it becomes another beast to feed the fiat or imaginary money system. Mm-hmm. And that's why the drive to accomplish this. I mean, in Ireland, they're, they're going to tax the ton of CO2 at about $25 per ton. But when is there going to be the scientific revolution to say, this is utter crap? It's happening. When are... it's happening. It's underway. It's underway. It's happening. So don't worry about it, Kate. It's everything. And we can only see our point of view. There is, there is a power that sees the entirety of this thing and understands that, that there will be a truth, um, an understanding, a revelation, a whistleblower. This is inevitable because all lies eventually come to the surface and are revealed as such. Oh, God. This, oh, this is so amazing. I'm just like, I just think we need to stop and just take in the beautiful point that you just made. You said last night when we talked, you said that this was part of God's plan. And I'd really like to hear because you just tickled my spiritual buttons, okay? Um, keep talking about what you're saying, please. Would, would we be having this conversation had this program not been an opera? <laughs> no, we wouldn't. We wouldn't. We would know each other. No. We would know each other. Yeah. And so there's two ways to view the creation, from the bottom up at the top down. And when you, when you can look at it from our point of view here at the bottom of the pin to the bottom of the physical realm, all you see are the problems. All you see are the half-truths, the deceptions, the lies. Mm-hmm. Or you don't. Or you don't. Mm-hmm. You can stay within your limited point of view, within your box, and you can be content with it. And then we'll call you a lemming. Mm-hmm. Or there's the, those the, of us that are not content with what we're told, that there's something inside of us that seeks, that yearns for that greater knowledge, that greater truth, because what we're being told just does not resonate as truth. Mm-hmm. And so we're not content, and, and it's, it's termed divine discontent. Mm-hmm. And so we're going to seek, we're going to look, we're going to find that which satisfies that discontent. Mm-hmm. And so from the bottom up, this is a pigsty. Mm-hmm. There is crap everywhere, and it is all over everybody, and you turn on the TV, and there is no truth. It's all one point of view, one, like Bill O'Reilly says, the no-spin zone. Well, I'm sorry, if it's on TV, then there is spin. Mm-hmm. Everybody's got the, their agenda, whether it's the anchor's agenda or whether it's the agenda that has been imposed upon that anchor or that point of view or that reporter. They have to report what they're told to do. Mm-hmm. because of the monetary system again. But from the top down, you see that eventually it all rectifies itself. Mm-hmm. That in time, given the longer time horizon, that the truth will be made known. It can't be held back forever. The mm-hmm. truth is too powerful mm-hmm. that the lies will fall away and will be mm-hmm. discovered for what they are. Mm-hmm. And, and that's just, I just know, I know, I know, I know. That day is coming, and it's mm-hmm. not very far off. Mm-hmm. Part of it is the awakening, and simply because of the work you're doing and the many other activists that are have, have taken up this banner. And I firmly, firmly believe that this is the one crime, if you will, that is visible to everyone if they could just have eyes to see what's happening. Mm-hmm. And this is one of my delusions in going into this is that I thought, well, five, six, seven years, you know, the atmospheric sciences community is so open and inquisitive like I am that they could see that these planes aren't right, that you explained that, you know, the trails to form and there's keen interest in other aircraft in these, these planes, in these contrails where there's perturbations or deformations or distortions, um, that they, would, they could see that. I mean, how many newsrooms don't have time-lapse cameras sitting on top of their towers? I mean, so, I almost... So, all, so why aren't they... Seeing it, I mean, why? I've heard that Operation I, Cloverly I is the most that. secret thing. Why? I still ask that question. Why? And it comes down to the paycheck. You know, I've gone ten plus years without a paycheck. Mm. You know, but I had, I had to do this. There was something else waiting for me. I was itchy, itchy, itchy doing the day to day to day. I was bored to tears. Mm. I had even told my general manager. 
uh, that I'm like, I, Bill, I can't do this. There's something else coming. I trust that there's something else coming. I just, I felt. I think it. we need to just speak, though, and really crack open this agenda of secrecy a little bit more. Because some, my little divine discontent is, is saying, you know, we've got to, we've got to really understand the whole political agenda. Um, you know, we hear, of course, about Agenda 21, now Agenda 2030. Um, we hear about the shadow government. We hear about the Rothschilds and we hear about the population, um, reduction and the, the Georgia Guidestones and, and the, the, the murals at the Denver airport and all of it and the underground bunkers and la la la. Um, can we tie any of these larger agendas, such as the agenda for massive control over humanity on the part of a very few? Is that something that's, you know, that's happening through this manipulation of weather? Um, can you speak about that at all? Well, it comes to, it comes to control. Um, those that come from a place of, of, of untruth and deception, the only way they keep that deception active is, is through control. Whether it's an abusive, alcoholic husband, every aspect of those that are on, that have been subjugated under that distorted person, that person tries to control every aspect of, of that family's life. So, but I think, aspect. but it's important to understand, are these negative, you know, criminal people, very, very wealthy people, are they the ones ultimately in control of this whole manipulation of the weather for their own purposes? Well, they, they are for now, but not for, not for. No, no, I don't mean forever, but I mean, you know, when we're looking at, for example, going back to the individual chemtrail line mm -hmm. being intersected by one or two others at just the, the appropriate points, is that in the service of a program that's being run by these demons? Yeah. Yeah. It is. It is. And then, I mean, you own the weather, you own the planet. You know, that, that you, that it is that simple. So that's why there's a secrecy then, you know? Because that, that grip has to be ironclad. Mm -hmm. And the sense can be tolerated to a degree so the illusion of freedom persists. But ultimate freedom will never be had until this control is broken. Plain and simple. So then how do we break it? I mean, you know, we went, we had a demonstration here not in Northern California. When the it's not up to us. To, when the time comes to break it, the divine will do that. The divine will have those circumstances aligned so that not one domino falls and not two domino falls, but the <laughs> whole bloody thing comes down at once. Okay, you know what I think, Scott? You know what I think? What do you think? Okay, I was, I, what I was, I just want to share something from my yeah, own yeah. childhood, okay? I received word, you know, an inward word. I think I was seven years old, maybe eight, that said, you are going to be part of something very big that's happening in your lifetime and you are going to be involved in it. Mm -hmm. And I kept waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And I do believe that this is it. And I do believe that, you know, I'm honored to, um, to be working alongside, you know, to be part of a movement of people that I greatly and deeply respect. And I'm so excited by, you know, the progress that we're making on all the different fronts and all of the activists doing their piece. And I do believe that in our lifetime, you know, in the next 20 years, 30 years, I don't know, uh, if we don't destroy the planet, which I sincerely hope we don't, that, that you know, we will bust this open or, you know, with God's help. I mean, I, I think that's why we're, I think that's what's going to happen. What do you think? Kate, it'll be done before this year is over. Are you freaking kidding me? So talk. Why? Why do you say that? I had enough inner guidance and, and experiences. Um... War is coming. War is coming. War is coming? It's really coming? Yeah, it's coming. It'll happen by spring. By spring. I mean, you mean between Russia and the United States? Uh, as a proxy, and we start it. The Americans, Obama starts it. We're the bad guys this time around. Oh, God. It's part of duality. We're the bad guys. Well, no question about that. But what, what ultimately happens is that Israel becomes the focus point. And that all these nations, realizing the Zionist agenda, the banking agenda, all say enough, 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 enough. And then there, there are multiple, multiple nuclear exchanges. 
and the humanity is brought to its knees. The banking cartel is brought to its knees. The military is, has spent their wad, if you will, and, and aren't able to get up the way they, they have been able to after these past wars because there won't be the faucet of money to rebuild them. But it happens this year, the first half of this year. Why? No, wait a minute. Okay, so we're, are we talking about divine revelation? How, you know, is it your, in your meditations? Are you, you know, you're obviously receiving guidance. But how can you be so sure of it? There was a young man by the name of Nathan, and he had a near-death experience in Israel last September. And, um, and if you look at his experience, and, and in fact, you can you can Google it, and it's it's all it's all in Hebrew, but there are subtitles. And it happened. Remember all the big the big to do last September twenty third. You know, the, all the stuff was supposed to happen. Da 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 da. Right, right, right. The last, the last blood moon and so forth. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But his near death experience happened on the night of that last blood moon, and he was dead for fifteen minutes. And he came back and, and gave his experience. Of, 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 of the judge of the dead and how every emotion, every thought, every action is recorded on your karmic scroll. Every action. And then there's the scales. Good, bad, good, bad, good, bad, good, bad. And um, he was then shown what's going to happen. Um, how all of the nations, well, actually it was 70 in particular, 70 specific nations turn on Israel. And again, seven being the number of this particular creation, the number seven. And um, that the IDF for Israeli Defense Forces would last for exactly two days. Two days. That's all they could hold off the world before that before it was crushed. And in this, and then my partner, who has had many many experiences and, and has them almost nightly, things to come, things to come. Oh. I'm beginning to have them as well. Mm. Um, that there are wow, I, I would say dozens of nuclear exchanges. Europe, North Africa, the Middle East, a few in Southeast Asia, and less than five here in the States. Less than five. But what ultimately happens is we're dealing with radiation. For generations to come on this planet, we're dealing with radiation. And so we change how we farm. We change how we grow food. We change the numbers of humans on this planet to a number that is sustainable because we're living in greenhouses. We're living under domes to protect us from the effects of this last incident, this last nuclear war, this, this thing that we'll go through. And once that happens, then there are other enemies, other races of, of humanoids that have been kept off this planet, kept from teaching us, kept mm-hmm. from, from advancing us spiritually and technology, technologically, you know, and, and, and those relationships have, have not been afforded us because of this darkness that's on this planet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's what this war this year ends, is our enslavement to the way it has been. It ends. Wow. wow. I mean, I just, I'm sitting here kind of having like this orgasmic <laughs> experience of contemplating all of this. It's it's just so, um, it's all so been- amazing. It's so amazing. It's, it's yeah. all perfect. It's all perfect. And this is something we have to let go of. And this is why I'm not on Facebook every day doing this and that and, you know, taking sides on this. Mm-hmm. Because this issue is going to be a catalyzing issue. And it's important that it be there so that there can be this nucleus of activists, of people who desire better for us, for all of us, to come together. And so in that way, from the top-down view, it is serving a very, very important purpose for humanity. And the environmental consequences are worth it. Because when this, this higher energy, this divine energy comes in, these things can be healed in the twinkling of an eye. Mm-hmm. Things can be made right. Science knows that what you observe, the observer changes the reality. That, mm-hmm. That's been tested over and over and over again. So my question to you is, who is the super observer? Mm-hmm. Who is the one whose point of view matters? Wow. Wow, that's a very interesting question. And so that's where we need to trust, that there is this super observer, one that is aware of everything, and has our spiritual involvement as the highest priority. Mm-hmm. To bring us those painful experiences, those 
awareness increasing experiences to to each and what each one of us at that perfect time so that we encounter each other when we're supposed to. Mm. We have our relationship difficulties so we can see through each other's limitations but yet recognize their strengths. And then we all have our job to do. We all have that important, important role to play in this un- un- unveiling, this revealing, this uh, Armageddon of the new future. Mm. Armageddon only means revealing. It doesn't have to be bad. It's only bad if you're attached to what is or what has been, not what's to come. Mm-hmm. So you're saying that the nuclear war that's coming mm-hmm. on, you know, we that that's, that's going to basically break open everything. So in other words, does it matter that, I mean, do we keep working to expose this crime? <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's why I can take a, a, a break from the website and, and Facebook, knowing that the inertia has been set in place, the date have already been decided by a, by an entity and a, and a divine energy that is so far above that I, who am I to say what's right and what's wrong? Mm-hmm. You know, everything has its appointed beginning and its end. And those those dates are set in stone. Mm-hmm. And I'm not one to, 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 to fight against what is divine and what is perfect. And, the and, yet, and yet I feel at the same time, okay, you asked about the divine observer which is God or the source energy, whatever you want to call it. All, um, all of which is not all of which, but some of which a small, sum of which has, has been implanted in each of us. And so our observation of reality and what we do to remove the darkness and to bring in the light and the love mm-hmm. that, that is our work, you know, and that if we don't do those things and I'm speaking to us, you know, all of the activists and all of the, the light bringers and the and the, the good people on this planet, what we do is important to bring in what's coming. It's not as if we can just sit back and go, okay, like get it out the popcorn. We're just going to watch this go by. No, no, but we, we just do what we do and, and encounter the people that are brought to us day after day after day. And just be that best person that, that you already are. You already are. You know, each one of us, as you talked about, that divine spark, that soul of, in us is perfect. As it's a fragment of the divine, you know, sheathed in, in, in thought and causes and, and in emotions and, and, and finally in this dense, dense, dense physical body that limits us from seeing that which is perfect. And so we just, we, we just engage and do the best we can within our, our day-to-day work. There's nothing else we can do and there is nothing else to do. Accept that. And so when you write and want to do a show, I say yes. I say yes. Because there's something creative that can come from our interaction. Something creative. And we're all creators. All of us. In our, in our degree. And then some of it's more limited than others. And some would have more altruistic goals than others. But we're all creators. And so we're here to create. And then, and as as we're freed of this weight of <laughs> of the cabal of the powers that be, mm-hmm. then 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 we'll be able to create something beautiful. So, so I guess I guess what's our you know in terms of getting really practical and specific as it relates to the geoengineering the, the movement to end geoengineering, um, where do we go from here? What what should you know in your view? What can we do as activists? What should we be doing? to help bring in the truth beyond what we're already doing. And how can we, how can we be more cohesive? You know, how can we not be, you know, how can we be really, I mean, I I feel like I just want to, one of the reasons I'm so excited about this show and I want this show to actually serve this movement. I don't want it to be about me. I want to bring activists on that can dialogue with each other and envision the future together um, which is why what you're doing. But can you give us your view of of the of ways that you see us moving forward as a, a geoengineering, anti geoengineering community? I think awareness has been the key, and that's that, that that is the limit of what we can do at this point in time. It's just sharing it, sharing it, sharing it, sharing it. Mm-hmm. And and what I learned is that. It's very, very difficult to push people into an acceptance. Walls go up. Mm-hmm. Walls of resistance go up far more quickly than they're brought down. 
Mm-hmm. And so for me, I've realized it takes four, five, six encounters with a topic before before the wall will come down enough to where they'll accept the potential that what we're talking about is happening. Mm-hmm. I'm just seeing a bunch of stuff outside. I want to step out and look. Yeah. Um, I, while you're doing that, I just want to tell you, I. so I have this, you know, I hope it's okay for me to speak about, you know, my relationship with my son, who I deeply love and deeply respect, but he's step, he's graduating from college this year. He'll be 22. He does not want a world in which weather is manipulated. And he does not want a mother that is researching the means by which it's being done. And he doesn't want to hear about chemtrails. And in fact, (laughs) he is so allergic to the word and to anything that would, you know, would, would indicate that the world is being controlled and manipulated by dark forces, you know, right now. I mean, of course, beyond that, there's light, but that he doesn't, he wants everything just to be normal. And so it's, it, you know, it just, and he will not look at any data. Mm-hmm. He, he, it's just amazing how such an intelligent young man, you know, can, can completely close off on this subject. And not yeah. only that. My sister and my my brother-in-law and, you know, their family and the whole thing. I'm an embarrassment to my family, not to my husband, but to my family. (laughs) Denial is a great place to live. Mm. You know, Mm -hmm. it it just it just is. And I was there for a time. I was there. I do. I was there because I didn't understand the motive. So can you talk a little bit more then? I want to just go back. I know that we've been like, you know, blissing out on all this wonderful stuff. But I want to just go back to your transformation. Like how, please. You know, I'm looking at a plane, low overhead, no trail. He is low. Um, anyway, everybody will have their day. You, you, they're, they're familiar with the term. They're familiar with, you know, a, a generic or an abstract reason as to why. And it'll just happen. One day they'll step out from their car or, or step outside and go, oh, crap, this isn't right. This isn't right. Mm-hmm. And that day can't be brought on any quicker than the day it's supposed to happen. So you just, you allow it. You allow them to have their experience in their own time. And in that moment, their conversion mm-hmm. will be complete and absolute. Mm-hmm. And so that's that's where we end up practicing patience. Mm-hmm. Patient, patience, patience. And it is a tough one because I really, really thought this would be a much shorter road than it is. And so I've, you know, I, I've gone through a bit of burnout, to be honest with you. I'm like, ah, I, I've seen it. I understand. It. I, understand. <laughs> I know what's going on, and I don't have to push it on, on anybody. And I'm in a community here in southern Colorado where everybody knows about chemtrail. Yeah. Everybody. Wow. You know, it, it's not something that, you know, you have to convince or, or you know, share them about. Everybody knows about it. There's probably 3,000 people here. You know, whether they're, they're, they're people from California who have, you know, sold their houses there and moved inland because they're thinking, oh, something's not right by being by the coast. Or um, they're, they're been in media in the past. You know, everybody knows about it. And so it's kind of a very comfortable, but yet it's, a, it's an island of, of reality in the sea of illusion that is, that is the rest of the world. Um, but you know, you know what, I just, what, what I just thought of that I think we should, should, should speak about? Um, you know, I worked and I have been working and will continue to work with Clifford Carnicom on his research. Mm-hmm. You know, he, in the year 2003, he found desiccated erythrocytes, desiccated blood cells yep. in the mix. Okay, so we've got a biological component here, which mm-hmm. led him, of course, to hypothesize about the many different aspects of this program, that it's it's not only weather modification. Nope, nope. You know, so can you speak about the health issues and like what what you know, I know that Dr. Marvin Herndon feels that, you know, his his chemical signatures have all come up to to um, to verify for him, to confirm for him that this is cold fly ash. OK, is so I'm asking you a couple of different things here, but, but no, really. Um, yeah, we've got the health. Okay, so let's start with the health. What, what, why are they putting, what's, what's the bio, you know, do you have an understanding of this biological agenda and Mordellans and what I why can is, say is yeah. that they, there's an end game that they're, they're approaching. There's an end game. They, they, they see a day that, that they can't do it any longer or they've done it as long as they can or their goal has been met. And if we're, and I really want to go here, we're 60 years into this program. Not 20, 30, but we're 60 years into this program. Right. As long as I've been alive, plus some. 
Mm-hmm. And so we, we've got an overpopulation issue that is agreed upon. Mm-hmm. How, how many billions, one billion, two billion, three billion people live on what, less than 50 bucks a day, are malnourished, poorly educated, in animalistic living situations where there, there are safety, safety concerns nightly. But, but, that but, 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 I maintain that it's not an overpopulation problem as much as it is a greed problem at the top, of course, the 1%. The, the, you know, so these people could be living just fine on the land that we have, they but could. they're not. They could because we're, cons- we're, we're, we're not taught how to grow and we're over-consuming. There's a way to be content with what we have, and that, that is the infection at the top of the pyramid. Right. It's the, it, or, or you could invert the pyramid, and they're the bottom pinnacle upon which the weight and the production of all of society funnels down to them. And it's just, ooh, but that's so, do, that's... so do you think that they're using this program then to also satisfy their depopulation ends? I mean, do you think that they're going, okay, well, we've got this weather program that we're, that we've got. We may as well, you know, accomplish our uh, destructive health agendas as well. Is that, is that what's happening? I agreed. And, and so in doing it, in managing droughts and flood situations, you know, they're banging the biosphere from too cold, too hot, too wet, too dry. And in between those polarities, there is very little peaceful, productive ground mm. and in that if you want to take an agricultural perspective you're you're pushing the land the homesteaders you're pushing the, the family farms out of business and then we have corporations with access to the federal reserves zero one two three percent you know market rates and they can come in and snap up these precious precious productive lands mm. for almost nothing mm. and so then then you Farm what you want to farm. You farm GMO. We don't have a gluten issue in this country. We have a Roundup contaminated food issue in this country. Mm. That's the problem. It's not gluten. It's the Roundup that is used to kill the wheat prior to harvest. So the Roundup goes directly to the kernel of the wheat, and every bite of bread we're poisoning ourselves. Wow. It's not gluten. It's Roundup. Wow. And so then you end up with you know, got GI issues, and then you feed oh. the healthcare system. That is the last hurrah of a poisoned population. Oh, my God. That's just devastating. Exactly. So the Roundup is really being used that widely? hmm Everything, whether you're killing potatoes, whether you're killing wheat and oats and soybeans and cotton, it allows for a uniform kill so they know they, they spray on this particular date that in two weeks' time they can go in and harvest every single acre at once. It's cheaper. Wow. Rather than the old ways where the potato farmers had to wait till a frost, and that frost date was variable depending on the climate. And then the potatoes had to sit in the field, they had to harden up, the skins had to firm up, and then they could go in and harvest. Not now. Not now. They rounded up. And then as the plant is dying, they know, the plant inherently knows it has to to create the seed so that the next generation is viable. And the Roundup infects the produce, infects the the kernel, infects the potato. It's just by design now. And that's why we're sick. That's why we're sick. Mm. So, and the weather is just one of those tools. You know, if you're going to rig a game, you want to have the king. You want to have the queen. You want to have the knights. You want to have the. the, the, the you want to own the whole chessboard, mm-hmm. so that your opponent is bloody blind to your next move, or the move move four, you know, four four lines down, mm-hmm. and and that's that's what it is. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a little scary. It's a little mm-hmm. scary. It's but, just very. It's also very fascinating. I mean. I don't really know why anybody would necessarily watch a TV program to take them into an alternative reality when this one, you know, if you like mysteries, I can't think of anything (laughs) more fascinating than trying to unravel all the different aspects of this one, you know? That's so true. And so there's, there's, there's ways to to get out of this. And that's part of why, um, you know, I'm a part of Blue Water Alchemy. And And what's that? What's that about? We make a product called Ormus. It's orbitally rearranged monatomic elements. And this was a, a series of visions that my partner was given, you know, 10, 12 years ago. And what you do is you take salt water 
and you alkalinize it or do a pH shock to it, and it rattles the electrons of the elements that are in the salt crystal. And then you consume it internally. A teaspoon a day is sufficient. Or you use it in, say, an ounce to a gallon of water in your garden. And what happens is you re-elementize your food sources so the plants are healthy. The freaky thing is, and I'm saying this out loud and I probably shouldn't be, is because there is a connection to dimensionally, the etheric field, the um, the biofield, um, these can revert back to their heritage genetics. That's the cool thing. Can you unpack that a little bit, please? What, what exactly do you mean? What I mean is that GMO doesn't have to be GMO forever. That there are ways to solve these problems that these corporations, these companies have gotten mm-hmm. But this particular right. blue alchemy product, what, what exactly is that again? And how do we take it? And, you know, well, like, how do we get some and all that? Good stuff? <laughs> well, and there's multiple sources. There are multiple companies that do it. It's just that I, I don't necessarily like talking about problems. I know, I know, I know. Solution. But, but what, is, what's, what is it comprised of? Salt. It's salt. I'm going to give you an example. The Indonesian okay. tsunami that happened Boxing Day, December 26, 2004, that one that killed 200 plus I remember. thousand people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what happened is that there were about 10,000 square miles of farmland that were inundated by seawater. So mm-hmm. water came inland. Those native farmers literally freaked out because they're like, oh, crap, we've been salted out. We're not going to be able to grow here. Not so. The rains came rinsed out the soils. They said, well, <laughs> this is the only land we have, so we've got to make the best of it. They planted their rice anyway. Mm-hmm. The harvest that year was double. The wow. Wow. The, the plants were more vibrant. There were more nutrients inside the rice that was harvested off those re-elementized soils. Yes. So in the water cycle of this planet, it rains, it snows, it bleaches these elements out of the topsoil it ends up going in the runoff to the creeks and streams and then eventually out into the oceans. We use the salt crystal as, a, as the, the salt is being crystallized or concentrated in these salt, these evaporative salt pans, or even in, in mined salt. These elements are there. So mm-hmm. we'll, take, we'll take the salt, um, dissolve it in water, and then shock it with, with, with lye water. With What's lye. that? What's lye water? It's pH 14 lye water. You take sodium hydroxide, you know, <laughs> add it to water, and it gets very, very hot to the point of boiling. And then you'll take that and gradually add it to this, this salt water mixture. And then okay. it ends up becoming this milky white substance. Okay. It's, it's potassium and calcium hydroxide plus these elements in their mono and diatomic states. And you take it. And when you, once you take this into your body, these elements, gold, silver, lithium, iridium, there's 14 of these enormous elements then come into your, into your body. The element iridium, element 77, when it attaches to your, your, your chromosomes and to your nervous system, instead of maybe able to communicate 10,000 electrons per second across your system, it can move nearly a million or five orders of magnitude greater. Wow. So the body then can see, oh, my God, I've got cancer. I've got this. I've got that. I've got this. Uh-huh. And so then it signals the stem cells in your bone marrow to create the proper ratio of stem cells to deal with the body's ailments. Wow. And so it's just, it's, it's brilliant. And it's this an sounds old, amazing. It's an old, old, old sacrament that the Essenes um, were able to, they made it. They made it for themselves back in, back in the time of Christ and, and long, 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 long before. It's old. It's part so of you, you take it, you put like a teaspoon of this stuff in water and you drink it every morning? Or what do yep, you do? Yep, yep. I, How does I, it I, taste? When, when I get it? out of the shower, I'll put about the size of a nickel in my palm of my hand, rub it together, and use it on my armpits. That's my deodorant. Okay. And then I'll take another another teaspoon and just straighten the mouth and, you know, let it let the saliva come in so the body recognizes what is there. And mm-hmm. then I swallow And then there's the sweet aftertaste. Is The gold in there then pings the pineal gland and you get this, this sweet aftertaste. Of this, that sounds out. amazing. So, so um, now, uh, is it expensive? No, it's not. It was when we, well, it was a lot more expensive when we started. Um, but at Blue Water Alchemy, we've just gotten to the point where it's just so important. It's Fantastic. Important. So, it's it's give, the website is bluewateralchemy.com or something. Uh, yep. 
Yep, and they all work. We've got different recipes. They all taste a little a little bit different than the others. But the Dead Sea Salt. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> I'm so excited. Yeah, it's it's so key. It's so key. And have you done? I mean, you know, is it just subjective that you're just feeling better, or do you? You know, can you tell us anything about, you know, how your own particular or other the health of others has improved because of it? Or We've had people deal with, you know, with cancers. They, they come in with cancer and they're like, oh, you know, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And, and they start with Orbis. And then the thing, the, the, the progression of the disease just stops. Fertility is huge, 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 huge. If there are, are couples that can't conceive, wow. then take Orbis, especially the man, especially the man. And then the mother during during gestation and and all through all through the, the the nursing period, it's just important to get these babies going correctly. Do you recommend taking this kind of an, on an ongoing basis? O- on, ongoing, until yeah. our food is healthy again, you yeah. have to have supplements. Okay, that's just the way it is. Yeah, we're a disease society, and that's because our food is processed. Yeah. There's yeah. no life in it. There are very few elements. And this is why every 26,000 years, these continents sink and then they, the new ones come up mm. and the soil is healthy again. Mm. There's a reason the Salt Lake is salty. That Pacific came inland that far, that far. Wow. Scott, is- I just want to just, just take a moment. Um, I know that, you know, in a, in a couple of minutes, um, we're, we're going to end. And I just want to say uh, this interview has been really monumental, and I hope that our listeners have found it as incredible as I have been able to in my participation with you. And your vision, your uh, your breath, your genius, your humility, um, your desire to serve um, has been just very, very helpful. I don't know. I can't think of the right word. Has been, has been illuminating. You know, has just been a real pleasure. And I just want to thank you um, very much for your time. And I mean, I just, I'm just saying that now because it, it may come. And I mean, I always, you know. But so, thank you so much. I'm, I'm here to serve. I'm here to serve. This is you, why I've had the life experiences I've had, and, and what's come across my path has come across my path for a reason. Yeah, and it's to share. It's yeah. solely to share. The sky shouldn't be Scott, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> I love Thank you, you so much. We'll do it again, Kate. I love it. Okay, goodbye and God right. bless. Take okay. Care. Is a grave mistake. Together we can change the tide. See the truth. And not hide the future depends on what we do. Speak the truth, bluer than blue. No rules, no rules, no taboo topics, no taboo topics, no fear of doom, no fear of doom. We are, we are American Freedom Radio, American Freedom Radio.